As fans, we often find ourselves at loggerheads with what does and doesn't constitute a brilliant episode. So much of the franchise comes down to individual taste, but one thing I think we can all agree is Spock's brain is camp perfection. There are fierce debates over what constitutes as stunning in the fandom, but one thing I think we can all agree on is that that episode of The Next Generation is pants. This list comprises those scenes that may appear in episodes that are not quite as beloved as other ones. They are examples, if you like, that sometimes the one cannot be substituted for the sum of its parts. But nor too should those parts be forgotten. For every Wrath of Khan, there's a nemesis. But for every brain, brain, what is brain? There's also an I need my pain. I'm Sean Ferrick for Trek Culture, and here are 10 perfect scenes in hated Star Trek episodes. Number 10, I'm not Picard. Q-less. How does that meme go? Q arrives on the Enterprise, Picard quotes Shakespeare at him and couldn't get rid of him on a bet. Q arrives on DS9, Cisco punches him in the face and never has to deal with him again. 10 out of 10, would recommend. The inclusion of Q, much like the inclusion of the Duras sisters in season one of Deep Space Nine, was a very clear way to try and unify Next Generation and Deep Space Nine. The truth is, as fabulous as John Delancey is, Q just didn't work on DS9. Now, it was cute having O'Brien recognize Q, but the joke wears off quickly. The writers had the wherewithal to show so early on in DS9 the differences between Cisco and Picard, proving that the former was no slouch when it came to dealing with demigods. Q may believe that Cisco is easier to provoke, but Q better just be glad that he's not a Romulan senator. The entire plotline of the auction in Quarks just drags, despite the welcome return of Jennifer Hetrick as Vash. Just like, everyone look around you, the station's gonna be crushed. Nobody seems to care. The one bright spark in this episode is the boxing match between Q and Cisco, the one that sees Q laid out on the ground while Cisco looms over him going, I'm not Picard. It is the one bright spot in this rather dull episode and, in my opinion, makes the watch worth it alone. Number 9. Paris begs Janeway for his chance. Threshold has been the butt of many jokes since its airing, and I'm not going to say that I'm innocent of that either. The first three acts of the episode are actually solid. It's the ending that makes the whole thing fall apart. We've spoken about this before. It's because of that ending that this episode is probably never going to turn up on like the greatest episodes list. But Robert Duncan McNeil's performance in this episode is not one of the issues. Though his scenes following the Warp 10 flight really showcases Cronenbergian transformation, yeah. It's his earlier conversation with Janeway that really stands out. Here he is, the flyboy, the man who is trying to make something of his life again, and he's being told that there's a tiny chance that he won't be coming back from this flight. It's not enough for him, and he begs the captain to let him do this. Initially, she just came to him as a courtesy, fully ready to assign Harry the job of flying the shuttle, but once she sees how much it means to him, he convinces her and us that he deserves this moment. And so thankfully, she allows him to go on the mission. Now, it's easy when talking about Threshold to cry about things like pizza and do the lizard wiggle, but really give it another watch again just for how good Robbie McNeil is as Paris. Number eight, training, definitely force of nature. The environmental episode of The Next Generation was by all accounts a very well-intentioned script that just never quite managed to come together. In fact, it had sat on a shelf since the fifth season. They would occasionally dust it off, flick through it and put it back on the shelf again. It would take until the seventh and final year of The Next Generation for it to actually get made. The thing is, it's an episode of two halves and one of them is far more interesting than the other and we're not talking about the environmental part. The most famous cat in Star Trek, Spot, becomes an actual terror in the opening scenes of this episode. By the time the doors open, we find Geordi on his hands and knees trying to coax Spot out from under the bed, Spot having destroyed much of Geordi's quarters at this point. Data arrives to find his friend hunkered down, contemplating grabbing a phaser. Data joins him on the floor and reveals that he's never attempted to train Spot. There's nothing particularly important about this scene, except for the fact that it establishes that Spot has magically changed from male to female, which will become very important when it comes to the events of Genesis a few episodes later, but it's a real slice of life moment in The Next Generation. It's just a two-hander between two, at the time, supporting players on The Next Generation. It's about a cat. Geordi was considering getting a cat, so he borrowed Spot, and is now considering shooting Spot. Data is not on board with that. Geordi 
I cannot stun my cat. Force of Nature is often brushed aside for its seeming mishandling of its pro-conservationism message, but really, it's got some gold in there. Number seven, I've been waiting for you, Meridian. Meridian is dull and it makes very little sense. Jadzia falls in love with a man she met five minutes ago, is willing to lock the Dax symbiont away on a planet that's locked in subspace for 50 years, and this is all before she's even seen if he pees in the shower. Girl. But the episode, for its faults, does contain a glorious little moment in there. A scummy man gets his comeuppance, and Quark gets a bit of a splash of cold water as well. Jeffrey Combs makes his on-screen Star Trek debut here, yes, this was his first appearance in Star Trek, despite the rumour that he's been there since time began. He appears as Tyron, a not very nice fella who becomes enamoured with Major Kira. Now, while the real Kira resoundingly lets him know just what she thinks of him, he then goes to Quark, who suggests stealing the Major's image and selling him a holosuite program where she is effectively a stand-in for a Vulcan love slave. There's many parts about Quark's character that really don't hold up to scrutiny. Now, of course, it's played for laughs when Tyrion enters the holosuite and discovers that Kira's body now contains Quark's head, saying, I've been waiting for you with those glorious Ferengi gnashers. Now, just what Quark era has been waiting to do to him, we can only guess, but the look on Tyrion's face sort of makes it all worth it. The overall plot of just how happy Quark was to sell Kira's image to someone leaves a little bit of a sour taste in the mouth, but it does make it a little bit worth it just to see that look on Tyrion's face. Watching a scumbag get theirs? Yeah, all right, I'll take it. Number six, does it really matter which Kess goes home? Fury is a maligned episode with strong arguments against it. Though it does bring Jennifer Leon back to Star Trek Voyager, it does so in a way that was upsetting. Kess was never cruel. Here, she arrives in Voyager, slams her ship into the side of it, cuts a wave of destruction on her way to engineering, and even kills Bellana, something that, quite frankly, Kess would never do. This does, however, lead to a scene that stands out for the right reasons. Thanks to a bit of time travel, Janeway was warned that Kess was coming. She clears a path from the impact point to engineering, and there, older Kess meets a holographic representation, recording, if you will, of her younger self, one that she made when this time travel shenanigans began. This younger Kess reminds her future self that she was, is, and can be again a good person. When Janeway and Tuvok enter engineering, on his birthday no less, they talk to her rather than come in firing. Jennifer Lee delivers a strong performance here as she comes around to the idea that maybe she can be that young woman again. She decides to take up Janeway's advice and travel back to the Ocampa. You can see that her discomfort hasn't entirely left her and in her exchanges with Neelix, but you can see that old relationship between Leon and Ethan Phillips rearing its head just again there at the end. As a coda for the character, it was sad to see how full of fury she had become, but in true Star Trek fashion, you could see that there was still hope and she wasn't truly lost. That makes this episode worth watching for the right reasons. Number five, you might be from the moon, Tommy boy, spirit folk. Now hear me out, Spirit Folk is never going to feature at the top of any Irish person's list of Star Trek episodes. It does skew a little too close to caricature for most of us to be comfortable with. I am going to make an argument though that might get me kicked out of home, which is, as this seems to be good natured, what's the harm? It's a million times better than Up the Long Ladder was, although that's a very low bar. Though, of course, Next Gen or a Voyager would never come close to touching the amount of representation we got in Deep Space Nine. Big up, Miles O'Brien. The best thing I think we could say about this episode is that it's well-intentioned and largely inoffensive. The final scene is actually pretty much how I reckon Irish people would react to finding out that, you know, they were being visited by spacemen all the time. You know, after a little bit of, huh, business as usual, really. Seamus is back trying to get a bit of coin out of Tommy Boy, now with the knowledge that Tommy Boy's probably got alien tech that'll help him. Maggie O'Halloran forgiving Harry, though, that's a little less realistic. There's very, very, very little chance that Harry wouldn't get a broken nose for that one. But Michael O'Sullivan welcomes Janeway back to the bar now with the knowledge that she could fly away and further each time. But it smiles all around, a couple of dodgy accents, but generally business as usual. That's probably what it would be like in real life, I'm not gonna lie to you. There's one thing though, fix the bloody sign over the door. You were even told in the episode. Number four, Riker's last chat with Trip 
these are the voyages. This was an episode that divided fans on initial airing and the grumbling has only really got louder in the years since. As a finale, These Are The Voyages does everything wrong. It shifts the viewpoint from the characters we had followed for four years to Riker and Troy, framing it as just a footnote on a Next Generation episode. The Coupe de Grace, of course, is of course the needless death of Trip Tucker. If one accepts the idea of Riker's presence on NX-01 via the holodeck, it's a fun idea. As a chef, he adopts a role that's quite similar to Philip Boyce in The Cage, in that he's as much a confidant as anything else. As Riker is experiencing events out of order, because he can nip in and out of the holodeck as he wishes, we the audience see events out of order as well. We see Trip die, and then we see his conversation with Riker. It's short and poignant, full of life that Connor Trenier brought to the role. Here, Trip is not just Trip, but he's also Enterprise itself knowing that the journey has come to an end. In true Star Trek fashion, there is so much hope in the scene as well, even if the mood may have been gloomy, knowing as we did that the show had been canceled. There is one thing that has helped the scene over the years in that since airing, Enterprise's popularity has actually continued to grow. So even though it came to an end at that point, the love for these characters has only improved as the decades have passed on. Cheers to you, Trip. Number three. Picard in the Romulan Senate, Star Trek Nemesis. Star Trek Nemesis has few defenders, for better or worse. It served as a poor finale for the next generation, which had enjoyed a fairly fantastic 15 year run. On top of this, it was lumbered with a director who didn't understand the source material. And it was also in the knowledge that just after Nemesis, Enterprise was canceled again, franchise fatigue had set in, Star Trek felt tired, and Nemesis seems to encapsulate a lot of that. However, within this film, there exists a scene so Star Trek, building on Star Trek's earliest ideals, that it cannot be overlooked. After being summoned to Romulus, and after a lengthy wait, Picard meets Shinzon down on the planet's surface. For the briefest of moments, we the audience feel hope. Though a clone of Picard, Shinzon represents the Remans, a subjugated race to the core. Having overthrown the Romulan aggressors, Shinzon now stands in victory, and together, Shinzon and Picard stand in the Romulan Senate. This is something that would have been unimaginable mere years before. It is Star Trek right the way through. Even though it's subterfuge, it still offers hope. It has aged well as, though Romulus itself did not survive the supernova, the Romulan people did, and they have embraced Picard as something of a hero. It is Star Trek. Number two, you're not Nana Sobrosa. Okay, now for a horse of a different color. Sobrosa is fun. It is also trash. It's got it all. It's got the gothic horror. It's got the romance. It's got Granny's erotic journals. It's got everything. I mean, maybe there's some scenes that could have taken another pass in the writer's room, particularly erotic entry. That's your nan. Saying that, there is a scene toward the climax that abandons all pretense of trying to take itself seriously. Felicia Howard has been exhumed by Data and Geordi. She sits up in the coffin, knocks them out, and turns to face Beverly. You're not Nana. Sorry, Gates McFadden gives this a hundred percent. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to tell you that it's a brilliant episode, but this scene is fantastic. It deserves to go down in the annals of trashy modes of Star Trek. And you know what? I love it. Number one, I need my pain. Star Trek V The Final Frontier. Star Trek V The Final Frontier gets a rough time from critics. And look, some parts of it may deserve the criticism, but this scene is not one of them. There is a scene where Cybok, Spock, Kirk and McCoy meet on the observation deck, and there follows a scene with such pathos and such intensity that it does not deserve to be simply swept aside. Sharing their pain the way Cybok asks them to could be swept off as some new age psychological nonsense. But, and that's not by the way to say that one shouldn't share one's trauma out loud. That's not what I'm saying there. But the way it's played here is taken so seriously. Cybok is modeled after those TV evangelists. And though that is on show here, it's also softened in this scene, where in real life they prey on the vulnerable. 
you actually get a sense that he is helping here. Spock and McCoy, in fact, especially McCoy, are given glimpses into the most painful memories of their lives. Spock sees his own birth, absorbing the knowledge that from his earliest memories, his father judged him as less than Vulcan. Well, Spock being Spock, he shows no real outward emotion to this. This is starkly contrasted by McCoy's vision. DeForest Kelly delivers a masterful performance here. There is no age when losing one's parent stops hurting, but Leonard was not simply David's son. He was also a medical practitioner unable to save his dad. Rather than seeing his dad live in pain, McCoy switched off the life support machine days before a cure for his illness was found. It's a devastating moment in the character's history. Kirk may tell Cybok that he needs his pain, but we, the audience, beg to the screen to please, please take away McCoy's. That's everything for our list today, folks. Thank you so much for watching along. Hope you've enjoyed. Anything you would like to add to this list, drop it in the comments below. Please make sure that you're following us on the various socials. I have been Sean Ferry. Please make sure you're following at Trek Culture as well. And please, please make sure that you're subscribed. It makes all the difference. Whatever you're up to, whether you enjoy the trashy or the deadly serious, just enjoy it. Make sure that you live long and prosper. Treat yourself well and treat those around you well.